thank you, everyone, for coming to join us today. I'm very happy to be hosting today's panel where we're talking to some of the best VCs in the world, talking about what's coming in the future, investing for 2019. Now, I think most of our mm -hmm. panel needs no introduction, but just in case some of those in the audience only know one or two of you, if you guys wouldn't mind quickly introducing yourselves, a little bit about your firm, and what types of uh, projects you've been involved with in the past. Great. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Juliette de Bourbonny, and uh, I have been with Kleiner Perkins for 18 years. And uh, together with my partner, Mary Mika, Mudragani, and Noah Nauf, we are spinning out of Kleiner Perkins and launching a new firm and a new fund in 2019, um, continuing what we've done for the past eight years, which is global growth investing. Excellent. Trey? Sure, I'm Trey Vassallo, and I recently started a firm called Defy VC, and our focus is early stage venture. So we're $150 million. We write three to $7 million checks uh, for 15% ownership in companies. And before that, I had the pleasure to work with Juliet at Kleiner Perkins for 11 years. And a part of my inspiration for starting Defy was this basically seeing these brand name firms with success get bigger and their investing tended to get later stage. And so I spun out and joined forces with Neil Sequeira from General Catalyst to focus on that early part of the venture capital market. Uh, investments in my past include companies like Nest, Dropcam, and No Power. Excellent. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Stafford, managing partner of DST Global. We are a uh, growth stage firm, very much like Juliet. We, we do uh, uh, growth stage deals on a global basis. About 40% of our capital has gone into Asia historically, about a third the US. The rest mostly Europe, but a little bit uh, uh, Latin America as well. Um, I'm based in London and also spend a lot of my time in Hong Kong and China. Uh, our investments in Europe are, include things like uh, Spotify, Zalando, Auto One, Deliveroo, uh, Revolut, uh, Bulb, and a few others. So nice to be here. Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Now, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs from many different sectors who are here today. Now, everybody wants to know what sectors you guys are looking at, what you're excited about in the future, where you're going to be deploying capital. And so this will help the right people come up and find you afterwards. So why don't you tell us what are the areas you're most excited about, what areas you're going to be looking to deploy capital in 19 and beyond? Then start with me. Um, so in many respects, I would say nothing much has changed. We will still con invest in growth companies where there is technical innovation. And that's why our portfolio spans the gamut from a company such as Untuck It, which designs shirts for the untucked look, through to a company like Spotify, Epic Games, um, where you've got tremendous platform innovation. What we look for hasn't changed. Great founders make all the difference. And so I think if you talk to any investor who has been doing this for a long time, they will say the first thing they look for is the founding team. And that hasn't changed. So I'm looking forward to meeting any other great founders. Excellent. How about you, Trey? Yeah, so we're a generalist firm. And if you look back at Neil and my history of investing, it spans everything from media to hardware to uh, you know, enterprise security. And so that is our focus, so to speak, at, at our firm. Uh, to Juliet's point, though, I'd say there are some patterns that we look for. And first and foremost, it does come down to people. And we talk a lot about what we call the authentic entrepreneur. And these are people who really understand the problem they're solving. And they understand it through you know, spending time in an industry, banging their head against a wall, trying to understand that problem. Uh, or, you know, or, or, or many, uh, you know, growing up, uh, you know, having, having an authentic sense of why something isn't working. And so they're driven, first and foremost, to solve a problem. One thing we don't like are entrepreneurs who come to us and are just spouting acronyms. You know, VR, AR, ML, all great. And I expect that you're using state-of-the-art technology to solve a, a problem. And so it's it's when you know you're elegantly making someone's life easier that uh, you know where we get excited, and you know where you ultimately can make a lot of money. So so that's that's when I would ask for you to come to us. Excellent, Tom. Yeah. So uh, I mean. Uh, in terms of the people and, and what we look for, I think it's, it's a very similar approach. So, so maybe just a couple of words on maybe some of the, the sectors and areas that we're interested by. 
I guess, I guess the first one is we, we like to just go where the consumer spends their money, mm -hmm. very simply. So if you look at the consumer globally, they spend about 46 trillion US dollars a year. Of that, 20 odd trillion is in consumer retail and 20 odd trillion in services, intangible services. Today, internet accounts for roughly 10% globally of that consumer retail. Varies wildly, but you know, South Korea very high, Africa very low, but 10% on average globally. And so we still see a lot of sectors and geographies that are underpenetrated, even in what we would, in this room, regard as pretty traditional e-commerce, et cetera. So that's one area we, we remain focused on. The second is even more exciting, which is the consumer spends 20 odd trillion dollars a year on intangible services. Only about one point something percent of that is online today. So this is financial services, healthcare, education, transportation, uh, food, etc. And so all of us in this room hopefully are using Deliveroo and Revolut, and if you're not, please do. <laughs> but actually, as a global phenomenon, that's a very small percentage of total spend. So that's also where we're following the consumer. Then the second kind of key theme for me is uh, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. So, so SMEs are basically consumers, right? The restaurant owner, she wakes up in the morning, she's just the same as any other consumer. She checks uh, uh, the Financial Times maybe online or the Irish Times. She orders an Uber to work. Maybe she's ordered Deliveroo for breakfast. Um, but when she gets to work, she suddenly comes out of the digital world and into an analog world. Uh, and that just doesn't really make a lot of sense. So she's getting a paper invoice from her supplier. She's manually reconciling with her bookkeeper how to you know, pay the accounts at the end of the year. When she has to find a new employee, she's doing a you know, WhatsApp group or text group, no, nothing digital. So the SME is a consumerized business by the people, but not by internet yet. And I see that changing pretty radically. And then the very final one is, uh, again, it's sort of a phenomenon that we forget about living in London or Hong Kong, is there's actually only 4 billion people connected online today, uh, roughly 50% of the world's population. And w that won't last for very long. So the other 4 billion people coming online uh, will disrupt and change entire economies. For example, in Africa, logistics accounts for up to 75% of the cost of a good bought in a shop in Africa. That's because those logistics mm -hmm. are not organized by anything technological. And again, that will change over the coming years. So uh, Juliet and Trey, I'm going to ask you to dig in a little bit more on the sectors, because Tom just laid out the entire world that he's <laughs> going to invest in all services, all goods, all trade. Which of those areas that he's talking about are you guys interested in? Trey, do you want to Yeah, start? sure. I mean, I'm happy to outline. If I look at our portfolio, we're actually trying to make sure we do have investments across a handful of sectors that we also believe are in disruption. Um, logistics, completely agree with you. We have a, a, a handful of great logistics companies. Enterprise security, a problem that continues to get bigger and bigger. We've got a couple companies in, in that sector. Um, media, so how we consume media, it's much more participatory. Uh, we have things like esports and fantasy sports that are completely changing entertainment. That's also an area we're, we're very excited about. And then, you know, I've had a history with uh, things like Nest and Dropcam, so I remain really excited about how we're turning our physical infrastructure into computing platforms. The house is a computing platform. The car is becoming a computing platform. So that also continues to be an area that we find very interesting. My business partner, Mary Meeker, publishes her Internet Trends Report every year. So we spend a lot of time thematically looking across the different sectors and across the different globes. Um, I think in terms of precision, the sharing economy is the one that's really captured our attention. If you look at the shift in spend, workforce allocation, the fact that in the United States this year, 50% of the population will be millennial and Gen Z. You think about flexibility of the workforce, you think about mo mobility, and you think about technology as the enabler. And then you think about the possibilities, not only for the disposable income, but then of the impact on the workforce. So that is an area that is of great interest to us um, as we look forward to investing. But we cover, as Trey also mentioned, a broad sector from consumer internet right through into digital health. Excellent. 
Yeah, that's a fabulous report, and uh, many in this audience, I'm sure I study it a couple times a year to check those <laughs> themes, so thank you for that. Now, the entrepreneurs who are in the audience from all these sectors are now going to want to come talk to you and figure out how they can talk to you about their solution is going to solve all these problems of those sectors. So let's talk a little bit about how do you, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs when they approach you? How should they approach you? What's the best way for them to get the first meeting? Once they get the first meeting, how do they get a positive impression and hopefully move to an actual investment? Let me take a start of that. We've, we've all got a lot of experience uh, around the table and we've had the opportunity to work well together and kind of swarm team approach. Um, but just to kick this off, I want to remind entrepreneurs, this is a two-way street. We have capital, you're amazing founders. If we are going to partner together, this is like getting married. We're going to be in it for the long term. Um, it took Spotify eight years before they had a liquidity event from our point of investing and 12 years since inception. So if you look at today's market, you can stay private longer. That means that you are in the foxhole together. And so for me, I want to see founders who really want to understand the quality of capital, the value from their investor, um, can really articulate what they need from that, that investor. Capital is ubiquitous, but support, advice, wisdom, experience, those are the skills that really can build significant businesses. So I usually see companies before they have a brand. And so it's really important how you reach out and which partner you're reaching out to. You'd be surprised, you know, you may think you have a connection at a large firm and you email them, but if they're not the right partner, they don't always share it with the right partner in their firm. So you have to do your research first, figure out who you're best connected with that person, because warm intros always, I, I will always take um, a call with someone who, that a friend has made an introduction to. So, so that's a really important point um, and just getting the initial, you know, on that investor's radar. I also always suggest don't send a few lines of text. Text doesn't really convey what you're working on. Send a few slides. Every detail around how you illustrate what you're working on really matters and conveys more emotion and what you're trying to build and more often leads to a call or a meeting. And then uh, two other little bits of advice. When you're in the meeting, um, I think entrepreneurs often forget your head is in this every day, every minute thinking about your business and you're meeting with someone who doesn't have much context for what you're working on. And typically a lot of investors aren't even product people, so they're not very good at visualizing what you're trying to build. Try to be as, as visual as possible. Show a demo, show a video, show your product right off the bat so they're not trying to figure out what you're working on right away. And then my last piece of advice is that don't forget you're being watched for your leadership qualities. So these aren't explicit questions, but I'm always looking for, is this a person who's empowering their team? Is this a person who can lead and who can scale? And so that's not going to come out in the form of questions, but it does come out in how you interact with your team, how you interact with everyone in our office. Um, and so keep that in the back of your mind as you're talking to investors. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have a huge amount to add. Um, I, th I think, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, investing is, is like any, anything else. It's quite a network-based uh, system. And, and there's only roughly 19 to 20 hours in a day to work. And so if you're going to receive a huge amount of inbound, you have to prioritize that in some way. And so, so much like Trey was saying, I think a warm intro, which is related to a, 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 another founder, uh, primarily, or a strong executive at a portfolio company will always go to the top of my inbox. And so that's a sort of slightly unfortunate thing because it tends to lead towards narrow networks. So we're always struggling against that. Mm -hmm. But just being very honest and open, there is only a limited number of hours in a day. And so I'd encourage you, if you're trying to approach myself or I think any VC, that warm introduction by even somebody who's one or two steps removed is really the key to getting to the top of the inbox. And then I think the second thing, which was also mentioned earlier, and, and is a really, I mean, I basically switch off when I hear some of these things. Like if somebody says to me, I'm, I'm building AI for virtual reality in an augmented set setting, I'm like, great. <laughs> I mean, I'm li literally not listening anymore. There's no point in talking about the acronyms. I think really what Trey said is absolutely right. 
describe the application. Describe why it's going to change a consumer's life or make, make an SME owner's life better or protect the enterprise. And then we can talk about the fact that you're the greatest ML mathematician the world's ever seen. But starting off with the acronyms actually just proves to, to, to shut down the recipient in how they're listening to you. No, it, Tom is exactly right. The amount of times I think we've all had businesses that were the uber of, you know, and it's sort of this herd mentality that you hear, and that for an investor is the biggest turnoff. Um, you have to have something that is unique, differentiated, with big vision. If you're going to follow the herd, chances are you're not going to get the dollars or pounds or euros. <laughs> and one other point, too, we really haven't highlighted the fact that, you know, you're there selling yourself and your team. Yeah. And I do meet so many entrepreneurs who don't spend enough time bragging about themselves and their team. And so this really is about investing in you and your vision and your ability to scale the company. So make sure you take the time to brag a little bit. No, I, I think that's right. We did a study at Kleiner Perkins about the success of our portfolio, and it correlated directly with founder-led organizations. So to Trey's point, you know, you better be really comfortable in who you are, what you're building, and who you're bringing along with you, uh, because that is going to be, in my opinion, the single biggest differentiator to make an investment decision. So uh, usually people don't need to encourage VCs to brag about themselves, but I'm going to ask you to a little bit because you mentioned earlier this is, it's a marriage and it's kind of like a founder driven market right now. And for some of the VCs, it's actually really difficult to get into some of the better deals. So each of you bring different elements uh, to the table. When you're pitching yourself to a, to a strong founder and a great deal and everybody wants to get in, what do you tell them? Why should they, why should they take money from you? Tom, I feel as though you need to go first because I'm getting the easy softballs and by the Please, time Tom. it gets to yes. you, can they kind of run out of engines. So can, can I defer Please, to Tom, him? yes. Yeah, but I have verbal issues, which means that I don't shut up. So, so let's be so, so please All right, we'll tell me him um, I, I would say that I, I'd actually disagree with the question a wee bit, Dan, and that I think it's always been a founder-led market uh, in the sense of the best companies, the best founders can always choose. Doesn't matter whether you're in 09 or 19, 2009 or 2019, it's always going to be the best companies you have to fight to get into. One of my slightly golden rules is if, if I'm waking up on a Friday morning thinking uh, this deal is really hard for me to win, to get into, that's the deal I want to spend all my time on. If I'm waking up thinking, no, oh, you know what, that, that founder really wants us to invest, that's, it's an amber flag for me, actually. Uh, the best founders never want you as an individual because uh, money is truly a commodity in our space. So what I pitch, frankly, is getting out of the way. I, I feel that I'm just a resource. Uh, I'm a resource to the founder and to the rest of the team to be called upon when they think I can add value, to be very honest when they think I can add value and I can't, and saying, sorry, I can't do anything about it. And maybe once, maybe twice a year at most, having an idea that I want to share with them. But at most, once or twice a year. So I'm a resource. I'm not trying to project my experience or my knowledge because I don't have any, particularly not for that specific company. I'm just a resource to them. And so the whole idea of an investor as this great value-adding tool, I don't believe in. I believe in us bringing a commodity, which is cash, bringing a little bit of common sense, bringing resources, and getting the hell out of the way. And that's what I pitch. Hmm. So I, I do think there's a big difference between growth capital and early stage capital. So when I invest, we're typically the first investor that actually takes a board seat. And so often, even if it's an experienced founder or a first time founder, they actually want um, more engagement and more help thinking through some of the strategic questions because they're going to get some things wrong and they want the support and the guidance through the right and the wrong. And so, you know, when we pitch, uh, entrepreneurs on why work with us, a big part of it is entrepreneurial empathy and entrepreneurial alignment. So um, one of the interesting things with our firm is, you know, I've been a startup founder before, I've shipped products before, and so having a board member, an advisor who is really more of a coach through the process, not thinking they have all the right answers, but can help ask the right questions and push, help push the founder in a way that really does make them 
kind of stop and think about some of the important questions. I think that's where a lot of the value add is. Um, you know, all the time, founders are trying to figure out, do I take money from a smaller firm like you, or do I go for the bigger branded firm? And that's a really fair question, and there are pros and cons to both. The great thing with the small firm, though, is that we're not trying to make you take too much money take the right amount of money that's right for you. And in fact, we love to build consortiums. So if you want to bring in maybe a more sector-focused investor, we love that. We're happy to do that. So we like to say that we're a bit more founder-friendly and that we will sort of organize around what you want and how you want to build your business. By the way, I, I, just to add to that, I think we're saying the same thing. And I think that the fact that you're a great investor is because you said alignment and empathy to the founders, which is the same thing as being a resource to them. I, where, where I see the, the negative on, on VCs and investors generally is where they think, oh, well, I built, a I, I built a startup before. This is how I do it, and this is how you should do it, therefore. And that, that's just destroying for, the, for a good founder, because they should have their ideas, make many mistakes, come to you for advice as yep. a resource. But rather than pushing on them, you should be there for them to pull from you. Right? That's a great, great nuance. Yep. So in terms of global growth investing, you know, when Mary Meeker started um, the digital growth fund within Kleiner Perkins eight years ago, we developed some really distinct skills and muscle memory around what it would take to be a long-term valuable partner with founders in global growth. Um, as a result of that, I agree, Tom, it has always been a very founder-led environment. What we want to do is to bring our team, and the reason we're spinning out is that we want to bring this sort of swarm mentality. My partner, Mood Raghani, likens it to the four of us have our own superpowers that we bring to the table, and we really do work as a team. When we sit down with, um, you know, I'll give you an example, Spot Home, Alejandro Atacho, we did a, a panel discussion this morning, Naren Sharma at Go Euro, they will tell you that they get the benefit of the four of us and they get all the years of experience that we are bringing to bear. And I always say to our founders, this is your company. Yep. We're here to be the assist. What I hope we can do is to save you time. I hope we can advance your networks, your contacts, your company building, your access to capital. I hope we can bring the playbook of what has gone right and what, what has gone wrong. But this is your company, and we are here to support you in every way. Well said. Well said. Well, this has been great to have you guys here. I want to give thanks to Web Summit for bringing us to Europe, especially to Portugal. I want to give a quick shout out mm -hmm. coming from Tencent. Uh, we work with Portuguese. Uh, company Miniclip, which I think is the largest gaming, if not one of the largest tech companies in Portugal, and is truly awesome. And so I've been very impressed with the Portuguese uh, ecosystem. And hopefully you guys will be spending a lot more time in Europe and Portugal moving forward as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you.